This week on Vaticano, Pope Francis appeals again for conversion during Lent and says the Word of God is the only weapon against Satan's seductive temptations. We meet different types of women who work for the Church, and Pope Francis imparts the ashes at St. Sabina in Rome. Also, this book on a Lenten pilgrimage dating back to the 4th century is released, and discover the truth about thousands of Eritreans who are kidnapped, sold, and bought in Sudan and Egypt on their way to Europe. And finally, a DVD on the first year of the papacy of Pope Francis is released, and each week an expert discusses a relic of the Passion of Christ, starting with a pillar of the scourging. All this coming up on Vaticano. On the 9th of March, the Church celebrated the first Sunday of Lent. During the Angelus Prayer, Pope Francis spoke about the Gospel of the Day, which tells about the temptations of Jesus. The pontiff reminded the huge crowds in St. Peter's Square that the only weapon against the evil one is the word of the Lord. Nel momento della tentazione, delle nostre tentazioni. In the moment of temptations, of our temptations, there should be no arguments with Satan. Rather, defend yourself always with the word of God. And this will save us. The Lord, using the word of God when answering Satan, reminds us that above all, man does not live on bread alone, but rather from the word that comes out of the mouth of God. This gives us strength. It sustains us in the fight against the worldly mentality that lowers man to the level of basic needs, causing him to lose the hunger for what is true, good, and beautiful, the hunger for God and for his love. Also remember that it is also written, Do not test the Lord your God, because the road of faith also passes through darkness and doubt, and feeds on persevering in patience and in waiting. Jesus finally recalls that it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and you shall serve Him alone. We have to get rid of the idols of vain things, and build our lives on the essentials. These words of Jesus can be found concretely in His actions. Three years later, his absolute faithfulness to the Father's plan of love led him to the final showdown with the Prince of this world, the hour of the Passion and the Cross. And there, Jesus has his final victory, the victory of love. Before leaving, the Pope made yet another appeal for conversion during Lent. The season of Lent is a favorable opportunity for all of us to make a journey of conversion, facing this page of the Gospel in an honest way. May we renew the promises of our baptism. May we renounce Satan and all his works and seductions, because he is a seducer, in order to walk down God's path and to arrive to Easter with joy of the Spirit. Later that same day, two buses with Vatican license plates left the pontifical walls. They took Pope Francis and 82 members of the Roman Curia to the nearby town of Aricia. They remained the whole week, taking part in Lenten spiritual exercises for the first time in recent memory outside of Rome. The meditations were on the theme purification of the heart and were directed by Father Angelo de Donatis. He is a well-known local retreat leader and priest of the Church of St. Mark the Evangelist in Rome. Maybe the world does not know what is happening in the Catholic Church and especially what are women doing in this church. And from my own experience, like being an executive director and traveling around for these projects the last 15 years, I was just amazed at, you know, that there's so many good things going on in, in, in the Catholic Church and in Catholic organizations. and. 50% of it is done by women, so maybe we have to let know the world and the church itself what exactly are these women doing. They opened us the door, we wanted the cinema, so we are now in the cinema gathering these 11 remarkable women from all over the world, telling us their personal stories, and we do that like in this special venue as the cinema and it's the heart of the Vatican and the stories will be told from women 
and it comes all from their heart. Voglio raccontare la mia fede, la mia fede servendo. Un po' di tempo fa. Talk about serving through my faith. A while ago, a few months ago, journalists asked me in England if I wanted to become a female priest. I asked them, what does a priest do? The priest serves, and I serve. And for me, the church has so many parts, and all parts include what everyone does for it. I serve as a woman, like a priest serves in different ways. And I feel that I am part of the church, because what I do is a service to the church. I represent the church. I work with Jews and Muslims. I am a representative of the church. Our faith comes from there, and people are aware of that. The places there speak to you, and the people speak to you. Everything there is the church. Everything there is the beginning of our faith. There is a support, there is a strength that you get, because everything speaks to you of Jesus. Everything speaks to you of your faith in Jerusalem. That what gives me strength is that Jesus died for this humanity, and there are still people who live their faith. I met my husband after a very traumatic event, the death of a person who was very dear to me. I met my husband, who was part of a group that evangelized, and despite my rejections, my no's, my husband invited me to a retreat. My husband invited me to a retreat where I found myself in confession with a very old priest who, when he heard me tell my story and all of the facts, at a certain point he cried. And the tears of this elderly priest, who must have heard so many painful stories, upset me. In the tears of that priest, and I still get some when I tell this, I saw God's mourning for my life. I saw that God had been waiting for me with so much patience and mercy, and that he had never abandoned me, and that he was waiting for me there on that day. I remember that after that, I cried for hours. I was an ocean of tears, and I could not stop. But for the first time, I felt so loved, but loved for what I really was, not for what I showed myself to be, because I had a lot of professional success but loved exactly for what I was, with my fragility, with my story, with my sins, with my weaknesses, with my rebellion. God loved me exactly like that. Rome, the Basilica of St. Sabina, rests on the Aventine Hill, one of the seven hills of the Eternal City. Built in the 5th century on the tomb of St. Sabina, this basilica is one of the best conserved early Christian churches. It is also the headquarters of the General Curia of the Order of Preachers. Traditionally, the Pope celebrates Ash Wednesday in this basilica. Each year, the successor of Peter, accompanied by an entourage of cardinals, processes from the Basilica of St. Anselm down the street to the Basilica of St. Sabina. Pope Francis himself imparted the ashes to those present. During the homily, he inaugurated the path of Lent through the penetrating words of the prophet Joel, Rend your hearts, not your garments. Opening oneself to God and to the brethren, we know that this increasingly artificial world would have us live in a culture of doing, of the useful, where we exclude God from our horizon without realizing it. But we also exclude the horizon itself. Lent beacons us to rouse ourselves, to remind ourselves that we are creatures, simply put, that we are not God. In the little daily scene, as I look at some of the power struggles to occupy spaces, I think, these people are playing God the Creator. They still have not realized that they are not God. 
and we also risk closing ourselves off to others and forgetting them. But only when the difficulties and suffering of others confront and question us may we begin our journey of conversion towards Easter. It is an itinerary which involves the cross and self-denial. Today's Gospel indicates the elements of this spiritual journey, prayer, fasting and almsgiving. All three exclude the need for appearances. What counts is not appearances. The value of life does not depend on the approval of others or on success, but on what we have inside us. The exhortation which the Lord addresses to us through the prophet Joel is strong and clear. Return to me with all your heart. Why must we return to God? Because something is not right in us, not right in society, in the church, and we need to change to give it a new direction. And this is called needing to convert. Once again, Lent comes to make its prophetic appeal, to remind us that it is possible to create something new within ourselves and around us, simply because God is faithful, always faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. He continues to be rich in goodness and mercy, and He is always ready to forgive and start afresh. With this filial confidence, let us set out on the journey. Con questa fiducia filiale, mettiamoci in cammino. In further events this month, Pope Francis will also be visiting a Roman parish, presiding over a penitential service in St. Peter's Basilica, and meeting with deaf and blind people in St. Peter's Square. Stay with us after the break. A book is launched on a pilgrimage done in Rome during Lent in the 4th century and revived now. Also, discover the truth about thousands of Eritreans bought and sold in Sudan and Egypt on their way to Europe. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. In this March the 6th press conference, it was revealed that Eritrean refugees trying to get to Europe are being bought and sold in Egypt. In Eritrea, c'è una situazione intollerabile. In Eritrea, there's an intolerable situation. There is a dictatorial regime so that they escape from this and from doing military service for their whole life. They escape to find work and to study. They make the journey from Eritrea to Sudan, where they are sold to Sudanese Bedouins, who then sell them to Egyptian Bedouins. It is both human and organ trafficking. Traffico di esseri umani e traffico di organi. Father Musi Serai runs the Habesha Agency, an association that helps Eritreans seeking asylum in Italy. For years, he has been denouncing the human rights violations in countries such as Israel, Sudan, and Eritrea. In questi dieci anni, sono morti più di 20.000 persone nel Mediterraneo. In these last 10 years, over 20,000 people have died in the Mediterranean. This is the trip they make, and then there are thousands of refugees who are able to arrive in some countries, like Italy, but are abandoned, like in Rome. They live in crumbling buildings, in shanty towns. So even here, where they thought they would be in a country that would give them protection and assistance, they find themselves in yet another hardship and in a degrading condition of life. It is possible to prevent human trafficking if the international community works to deal with the root of the problem of hardships that force these people to leave their country. That would be the best solution. But in this time that those problems are solved in their country, actions should be made in the countries where they pass through. Aside from this, they can also be given better opportunities through the investment of more money with international cooperation like offering scholarships, internships, and other projects so that they are safer in the country of transition. Nearly 10,000 Eritreans reached the coast of Italy in 2013. Each year, thousands of others risk their lives to reach North Africa, where many are kidnapped, tortured, and sold as merchandise for organ and human trafficking. In the 1980s, the Pontifical North American College revived a Lenten pilgrimage that dates back to the 4th century. Every day for six and a half weeks, Mass at dawn in the beautiful and ancient churches of Rome is the Station Church pilgrimage. 
John Paul II's biographer, George Weigel, and his son Stephen, as well as art historian Liz Lev, enjoy the tradition so much that they wanted to share it with the rest of the world through a new book called Roman Pilgrimage, The Station Churches. This book is a way to make the ancient Station Church pilgrimage of Lent uh, in Rome, uh, really without coming to Rome. Each day of Lent, uh, there is a description of the Station Church of the day, the day that back in early Christian history, the Pope would lead the daily Lenten Mass of the Roman Church. There is a commentary by me on the liturgical texts of the day from Mass and the Liturgy of the Hours. And then there are Stephen's photos, which put you inside the experience of making the Station Church pilgrimage. It was part of Roman life into the beginning of the second millennium. But when the popes moved to Avignon, the tradition of the pope leading this pilgrimage really ended. And while the memory of the pilgrimage remained in the Roman Missal, because every day in the pre-Vatican II Missal, every day of Lent had a stational church notation. Ash Wednesday, stationed at St. Sabina. Thursday after Ash Wednesday, stationed at St. George in Valabra. It's only in the past 30 years that the habit, the tradition of walking to each one of these churches each day for Mass has been revived. And it's really an Anglophone experience in Rome. North American College began to do this. Now you've got kids from American University campuses all over the city. Uh, diplomats, English-speaking members of the Roman Curia, hundreds of people coming to these ancient churches, often built atop the home of the martyr uh, they uh, honor, uh, every morning at seven o'clock for six and a half weeks. It's an extraordinary sight. How many times have you done? I've done the whole thing once. I've done it in bits and pieces many times. But it was three years ago that my son and I came here, and with Elizabeth Lev. Uh, did everything. We just did the whole thing for six and a half uh, weeks and the book is the product of that. There is a certain wow factor when you step into some of these churches that I tried to capture but some of them are, are massive so you know there's only so wide a lens you can go. Um, but I think overall uh, I got many of the exciting parts of the churches well documented. In the print version the photos are mostly in black and white which at the initial time of the project I was very into because I was in a black and white stage in my photography. But there is a lot to offer with the color photos in terms of things that you just miss out in, on. Um, so I think that that's the major selling point for the electronic book, aside from the light factor of a lot of the devices and carrying it around if you are actually lucky enough to be here doing the pilgrimage yourself. When I was writing the biography of John Paul II here in the 1990s, I would go to the station churches with the North American College students and faculty because I was living at the college while I was doing that. Uh, and in 2010, it simply occurred to me that it would be a great thing to allow people who don't have the luxury of coming to Rome for extended periods of time to experience this extraordinary way of doing Lent. So the idea popped into my head and uh, there we are. The book is now published. I gave the Pope a copy of it uh, a few days ago. He was very grateful. And I showed him how the book was set up and he seemed quite interested. Stay with us after the break. A DVD is launched on the first year of our new Pope and we talk about a relic of the Passion each week, starting with a pillar of the scourging. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. The Vatican Television Center is celebrating the first year of this papacy doing what it best does. They've released a video that includes the 50 major events of the last year. This video narrates the gestures, the words, the magisterium of Pope Francis during the first year of his papacy, one year that in some way gathers the legacy of Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict left his papacy saying it's important to convert the heart, to not be scandalized by sins, that we always think others do them, but rather the important thing is to have a docile heart at the disposition of the Holy Spirit's action. Well, we can say that Pope Francis has kept this inheritance from Benedict XVI, and he is helping us to follow a path of discernment, 
a path in which he asks us to open our hearts in order to allow for the gospel of the Lord to live within us. Monsignor Viganò admits that Benedict's resignation and all that it entailed was a trial period for the Centro Televisivo Vaticano. From the moment of Pope Benedict's resignation, there was a lot of work for the Vatican Television Center. Difficult and of great responsibility because we had to give the world an historical moment, a moment of supreme importance that wasn't the resignation itself, but rather everything that came with it. This means Benedict XVI's move from the Vatican to Castle Gandolfo. From that moment, our goal was to tell the world what was happening within the church, the encounters, the debates, what the cardinals were thinking, what the new ones wanted from a new pope, as well as all of the preparations of the conclave, from the Sistine Chapel to the stoves, the rings, the dresses, etc. The idea was to get the spectator inside and actively participating in an historical moment of supreme importance for the history of the Church. After the start of the conclave, we followed step by step everything that happened until the moment in which the chimney of the Sistine Chapel let out white smoke. From that instant, our goal was to tell the first moments of the papacy of Pope Francis. Throughout the short film, the spectator sees new images never released until now. But for Monsignor Viganò, the true novelty of the film lies beyond the images. In the video, there are some unedited images, like the footage of Pope Francis seated at the pilot's cabin in the airplane during his first flight to Rio de Janeiro. Also, the first moments of Pope Francis after the election in the Sistine Chapel, during the subsequent prayer in the Pauline Chapel, a few moments before going out on the loggia, the balcony of St. Peter's. So there are some new aspects, but let's say that the true novelty is the intention with which we have wanted to tell of the one year of papacy that has been a year of blessings for the people of God. Each week of Lent, Vaticano will show you one of the relics of the Passion of Christ. Our expert, a professor of Biblical Theology at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross, specialized in the New Testament. For many years, pilgrims used the bridge of Castel Sant'Angelo to reach St. Peter's Basilica. On the order of Pope Clement IX, Italian sculptor Bernini designed ten angels in 1668 to go on the bridge. Each of them hold a relic of the Passion of Christ. The Pope tried to put yeah, the main relics of the Passion here in the bridge of Castel Sant'Angelo in, in such a way, so far, our, an original way in which you see that every angel has an instrument or a relic of the Passion. But there are many, but of course, we begin here with the whip, and then we have here the column of the scourging. And then we continue with the, with the crown of thorns, the, the veil of the Veronica, and then the cross, the nails, and the other instrument of the Passion. Yeah, the column of the scourging. Uh, we have a, a bit of a, yeah, incertitude about the tradition of the column, because in the, in the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre, there is a special chapel with the column of the scourging that is venerated by the Franciscan of all the pilgrims that go to Jerusalem. But there is also a tradition of a cardinal in 12th century that took the column of the scourging and he brought it to Rome. And there is a very nice chapel with mosaic of 10th century before, yeah, the chapel um, of San Sosimo, if I am not uh, mistaken, in Santa Praxedes, 
Praxedes is a church very close to Santa Maria Maggiore, and there is another column of the flagellation, or the scorching. The only problem is the, the column in, uh, in Jerusalem is from brown marble, while the column we have here is white with very uh, big stains of black marble.